Bifido. It's bifidobacteria. Okay. And we have bacteroides, so there's a lot of bees in there. Okay. Okay. I only have that one. <laughs> so we are, we are. Um, so anyway, just so you know, we we've been having a good conversation, but we're live right now. Oh, okay. So I'm giving people a chance to listen in on our conversation as, okay. we, as we record body politics. Okay. Um. So I'll do like a real official opening, but <laughs> <for now. laughs> but you but you were asking me a question, so as I finish my food. And as we get set up, then we can just let's let's get to where you, you had a question. So yeah. The question was So my question was, hmm, it's really this is all hypothesis and theory. But what's your theory? If we if you have a thousand clients who are vegan and you have a thousand clients who are carnivore, do you think at the end of the day, if we watch them for 10 years, who's gonna have better teeth? Who's gonna have a better gut microbiome? Who's going to have a men better mental status, skin issues, autoimmune? What do we think? Because the way I see it today, uh -huh. you keep me very balanced, Robert. But what I've been studying, because I had my own issues with anxiety and meat seemed to help with that, it seems like the more carbs we eat, what we think is so clean, what the government's been pushing us on, lentils, rice, salad, grains, whole grains, it seems as though that's sugar, that's carbs. And when I talk to friends about that, they say, what do you mean it's carbs? It's not just carbs because maybe I have this concept wrong, but when I think of protein, I think of meat, animal meat. When I think of carbs, that's fruits, vegetables, smoothies, lentils, rice, all the things that we were told is plant-based, is, is clean eating. So my question is, at the end of the day, in 10 years, would you say the carnivores are doing better or the carb eaters? So again, you speak in you speak in a way where it's extreme because there's these huge comparisons, right? Carnivore way over here, um, carb eat all the carbs over here. Like everything is extreme, and so for me, my mind doesn't think like that. Mm -hmm. It thinks on meeting people where they are. Right. And I guess the best example I could give you was, and I think we talked about this once, but. When you look at sodium in the, in the relationship between sodium and high blood pressure, the thought is that salt is a major driver of high blood pressure, right? I mean, that's kind of out there. A lot of doctors say cut back on the salt, et cetera. But the science says it may not be the salt. So when I went down that rabbit hole, because that's extreme, right? Avoid salt at all costs. Oh, salt's okay. Who the hell are they, right? <laughs> When I went down that rabbit hole, I was looking for a study that confirmed that salt will drive high blood pressure. And every time I would talk to a physician, and I have many friends who are physicians and they talk about salt being the driver, can you show me a study? And no one could show it. And so eventually the only study that I've been privy to discover that says consuming salt causes blood pressure to go up was when they did the DASH diet. So the DASH diet is a diet that they put people on where they cut the salt down big time. You didn't add any salt to any of your meals. They had them eat the same amount of calories as everyone else. The difference was one group had salt, one group didn't. The people who didn't have salt on the DASH diet, they all saw their blood pressure go down. That's extreme, right? But, and then they said, it's salt. See, we proved it, it's salt. <clears throat> My question would be, with the DASH diet, you also avoided seed and vegetable oils mm. because there was no processed food. So I think it's the mm. processed food that's the driver, but they're, Pendulum all the way to the left is salt because everyone is all about extremes. And that's why we can never get it. One day you can, they say, don't eat, drink coffee because it's bad for you. Extreme. Then the next couple of years go by. Oh, no, two, three cups a week is fine. Then, oh, avoid butter at all costs. Is, mm -hmm. Then, oh, butter is fine. Uh, don't eat, you know, it's like all these extremes. And so whenever I, I believe you're going extremes mm -hmm. to extremes, you will never ever get to the place of clarity. So 
is the assault. And I think a lot of the questions that you, you bring up, it's the extremes. And I get it because the average person is going to run after extremes, right? It's kind of like I was, I was talking yesterday. Um, and in the last 14 months, right, I've had 14, no, 12 people who were completely type 2 diabetic. The highest hemoglobin A1C we had was 14.6. That's very high. I had one lady who had triglycerides over 5,000. She was admitted to the hospital. Her triglycerides are normal today, mm-hmm. following diet free life. Those 12 people who were confirmed type 2 diabetic, to include the woman who had 14.6 hemoglobin A1C, her fasting glucose is 300. If you stay 300, you're going to be blind soon. You're going to have mm-hmm. limbs cut off. Today, she's normal. And she's actually becoming a diet free life coach. So if I take 12 people and I doubt if there's a doctor out there that can say this and they have 5,000 patients. So I may have a couple hundred clients that I keep that I coach and 12 of them were type two diabetic. And this is a question for you. And now they're not. What else do I got to prove? Nothing. They didn't do extremes. They've all eaten yeah. carbs. They still go out to restaurants. They all eat different foods. Some are pickier than others, but they're no longer a type two diabetic. Beautiful. Yeah. I don't. I don't know what else. What else? What else do I need to, to do and say? Right. And that's why I love learning from you because you're so balanced. Can you help keep me back in the middle? Because even I love to talk about cholesterol. So I think the salt story is tantamount. The cholesterol story. Mm-hmm. I worked for Merck Pharmaceuticals. So I was visiting doctors in Ventura County talking about cholesterol medications. And I did programs and we were still in the beginning of the cholesterol craze. And we all learned that HDL is beautiful and LDL is bad. You better keep your LDL down. It seems like things are changing, just like we thought salt was bad. We thought butter was bad. Replace it for merger. Well, most people still believe that they're bad. Yeah. And we, thought, <laughs> and we thought butter was bad. We should, you should use margarine, which is heart healthy. And I think vegetable based, I don't even know what margarine is. And now it seems like the cholesterol story is changing that perhaps meat is okay. Perhaps butter is okay. What is cholesterol? Coming? Well, for those who are in the know, right. unfortunately, there's a lot of people that aren't in the know. So maybe we can figure this out. Just like you're saying, it's good to be balanced. So what it seems like I started studying cholesterol recently and mm-hmm. listening to a lot of doctors. All right, so hey, you guys, we're going to get started here in a second, but let's finish this point. Okay. okay. So cholesterol. <laughs> this the is whole, behind the scenes. <laughs> the whole world knows yes. cholesterol can be so bad for you. It's dangerous. You can die from it. It causes heart disease and blood vessel damage. You better have those HDLs high and those LDLs low. And if you don't, you better take this pill. Well, it turns out perhaps and the doctors that I'm following and listening to people like you trying to be more balanced is teaching me that what I learned at my pharmaceutical company that I worked for for five years and I really pushed these pills. The key words, you work for a pharmaceutical company. Yes. So is there a financial, is there a conflict of interest? I don't work there anymore. No, I'm just saying, but when you were doing it, of course they're going to tell you what you need to know based on what they're selling. In the past, right? Yeah. Oh, I was brainwashed. I was all in. I was all in. Okay. So now today, not working for a pharmaceutical company and not having any financial interest there because I'm not getting a paycheck there. So I looked at cholesterol medications and physicians talking about it, it seems like the new information is that you sit in the sun to get vitamin D. It helps convert the cholesterol into its proper format or create cholesterol itself. And we need it for healthy testosterone. Mm -hmm. We need it for healthy estrogen. And there's even something called vitamin K1, which needs to be converted into K2. And cholesterol does that job, which keeps keeps our insulin balance, which I know you're more of a proponent of insulin. Well, over and I'm a glucose. believer that you need cholesterol in order to, for a whole bunch of functions. So then why would why would we look at the results? By the way, they hid the data, supposedly. We don't see the data and the people in these trials. Mm-hmm. But we do see the end result of taking a cholesterol-lowering medication, memory issues, muscle pain, and other issues. So if you just look on the internet, you see people in the comments talking about what happened to them or their loved ones when they took a little cholesterol pill. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look pretty. Hmm. Some people do fine. A lot of people don't. So that's my question is so just what like is salt. The question? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's similar to the salt question. Is salt 
good or bad. It seems like it's probably good and healthy. And is cholesterol healthy? And if it's not, do we really need to take a bill? So what do we think of cholesterol in general? My view is a little bit extreme. I have a feeling that we never need a pill that I guess if a person's not willing to exercise and eat right, maybe that is when a pill is good for you, a cholesterol. Okay, well, pill. you just said a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back so you, we can have clarity with you because you have a great question. When someone says eat right, like I remember I was on this TV show. It was like CNN, but it was in Russia. It was more Europe. And on the show, this woman kept talking about eat right, eat healthy, mm -hmm. eat healthy, eat right. Mm -hmm. And I asked a question and everybody got quiet. I said, who defines what makes it eating healthy? Who defines what makes it, what makes one way eating right compared to another way? Who establishes that? Because if we keep saying you got to eat healthy, well, what does that mean? Because I have vegan friends that will say, if you eat chicken or steak, that's not healthy. So in their mind, right, and you got millions of people watching these shows, they're watching going, yeah, I would never eat meat, so that's unhealthy. And then you got some people, like your, yourself, maybe going, no, I eat, I eat meat because I know that's healthy. You know what I mean? So yeah. like everyone's in a different place. Yes. And how do you get everyone on, at the table to have a conversation? And that's why my podcast is called Body Politics, because you must eventually cut through the confusion and get to a place of clarity. And you can't do that if you're uninformed. So my ongoing answer to when people say, can we ever reverse the damage that people are experiencing with health? Can we ever reverse childhood obesity? And the sad part is I don't believe we can because the uninformed are being influenced by the misinformed. So if you have a bunch of registered dietitians who are trained on the dietary guidelines and the USDA, the pyramid, that is their truth, right? And they're not gonna falter because they get paid based on promoting that truth. So money's involved. If you have a multi-level marketing person who is all about like certain products that they're, they're selling, and they believe the literature they're given to them and they get that first check, they're not going to change how they look at things because they're getting paid. I don't want to mess up my promotion. I don't want to mess up my levels. And so they're just the same as when we sit back and watch Democrats and Republicans and independents battle. All the way, it's all relative. So at every level, you have everyone who's biased. And the big challenge that I have with, with coaches that I train and work with is that most, most, people that I meet that want to be a coach, they don't have the compassion or empathy to walk in my shoes because you have to be able to meet people where they are and not every person can be that kind of coach. So you'll hear me say things like you must be have the heart of a teacher because mm -hmm. you got to really care. And when I think about teachers, I think about this teacher when I was in first grade learning how to hold my pencil. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember like it was yesterday. They teach you how to hold the pencil. Mm -hmm. I started to, to write. And the way I hold my pencil today, which I'll show you, I never learned correctly. Mm -hmm. And I remember the teacher coming by and she would change. She would fix my fingers and twist them. And I'm trying to do it. But then I would go back to where it was comfortable. Oh. And I remember my teacher looking at me. She gave me that look of disgust. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And... I never change. And I believe that that is taking place in so many areas of our lives. And it's, it's the lack of empathy and compassion. And it's all about, I want to be right. Right. And if you follow carnivore, if you follow keto, if you, if you follow all these different diets and it works for you, you're ready to battle with people. You're like, Oh no, no, no. Let me tell you, let me tell you. And everybody's ready to like prove that's politics. It's body politics. It is. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in the middle going, can we all just get along? <laughs> can we, can we all, and that's the difference. Like, so when I meet people and they say, well, what are some of the key differences with diet free life? One of the differences is that, you know, and I kid you and I'll quit rambling, but this morning I talked to a lady who called me very nicely and uh, I'll say, What's up, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> so Kelly, like, uh, I met her because one of my clients who just 
lost her hundred, lost a hundred pounds. Mm. Have been going on and on, Sharon. And Sharon's amazing. We love Sharon. Um, she's down a hundred pounds, and so she's constantly telling people about diet food. Like, constantly like telling people that I have a program available for people. And finally, I think it's her daughter-in-law said, "All right, I'll, I'll I'm interested." And I told Sharon, I said, "Tell her just to give me a call or text me." I go, "I talk to everybody. It doesn't cost it. There's no money involved." Let's, let's let's make let's keep it real so she texted me this morning i was on my way to get a little haircut a little trim up <laughs> and um as i went i was in the car i just called her and we had a great conversation and her concern was this robert it sounds great but i am a picky eater what do you think my response was you can still work with her that she can be a picky eater because I, it's a diet free life. It is. She doesn't and, have to change. And she did love the idea. She used the word freedom. She goes, I don't want to be on a diet. I like freedom. I was like, I was like, look at the name, diet free life. It says everything. And I said, you know who my best clients are? And she goes, no. Picky eaters. <laughs> because if you're a picky eater, that means less options. So you tell me what you want to eat. And I'm going to show you how to eat it and still get the outcomes that are measurable. And all the clinical people and the academics can all respect it because if the triglycerides are better based on what we consider to be better, if your blood pressure is better, if your energy is better, if all these markers are healthier and you are able to eat the things that you like to eat, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. But the world doesn't know, like the majority of the world don't know about diet food rights. That's the next step for me is to get the word out. I love it. You were talking about dietary guidelines. So I have a question about that. Yeah. So what you were talking about nutritionists, and I'm sure in, by inference, it's doctors, it's hospitals, and they go by what the government has set up. Which they is, have to. They have to. They so. have to follow institutional principles, right? Whether it's the hospital, whether it's the prisons, the school system, and the list goes on and on. So all of those people, whether they are aware of it or not, are are going with the guidelines that you feel needs to be turned upside down right so the way i see it is the the it looks like this it's the pyramid mm -hmm. so there's the grains fruits and vegetables at the top all the well, meat. actually the grains are at the bottom the grains are at the bottom okay i thought the meat and the butter was at the bottom no. but things have changed no they're more toward the top and what you're saying is true flip it so the bottom is the base so what they're so what you're saying is is correct i hear what you're saying yeah but when you look at it you'll see that the base is really strong and broad. That's where you have all your grains and your, your carbs. Okay. And then as it goes up toward the top, it starts to get more toward like the meats and oh, okay. You, you follow Yeah, me? I see what you're saying. Um and so if you flip it, then the base could be the meats, right? right? And all your proteins, and then you eat fewer carbs. Right. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. But again, that's that's all financially driven. And a lot of people don't want to eat crow and then you have certain things that are just in place and it's going to create you're going to need some major disruption to change it and people aren't even the majority of people aren't even thinking about it and then the people who think about it right because there's podcasts out there right someone who's pro carnivore pro keto pro like paleo they're extreme so that's why it will never get it will never get fixed you, you get I've done work with Aetna Insurance as a $120 billion company. And the reason why I was able to work with them is because I could meet people where they are and stay within the guidelines, the U.S. dietary guidelines. Someone who's doing or promoting carnivore or promoting keto, they can't go into a, a medical institution like that. They're not going to take responsibility for you having their Medicare or Medicaid members following this program. No way because they'll be sued. You can't, you, you, so that stuff will never happen, but I was able to make it work because of our flexibility and all the people that, you know, and as much as success, New York times bestseller, they cannot work with the Aetna's and anthems and United healthcare's, but I can and have and have that's the game changer. So I'm really the middleman that can bring everybody together. If you think about it, 
because they'll, the American uh, the American Diabetic Association, the American Heart Association is never going to adopt carnivore. They are never going to adopt keto. Well, I don't know if you saw it in my eyes, Robert, but about a minute ago, <laughs> you actually changed me. I'm not kidding. My open-mindedness that you and I both talk about, we both have, it actually did click a little in me. And where I was going was there are people that are going extreme carnivore and they have to, some of them have multiple sclerosis or they've got and they believe bipolar. It, right? and, Someone told them. Right. I get it. And then there are the vegans who say, I clean, I'm plant-based, it cured my cancer, it cured this and that, right? But what I'm realizing as I'm thinking about because I tend to lean more carnivore because I've got rid of my anxiety and I have pretty severe anxiety. It was probably could have been called depression. Okay, and remind me of that because there's something I meant to say okay. about the SSRIs. Okay. Okay. So something clicked to me where I realized carnivore, you can't tell me not to eat another cherry again. You know, you can't tell me never to have rice. So I like what, where you're going with diet free life and bodily body politics because it's, it's about balance and everyone wants balance. No one wants to be. I don't know if I can say this properly. I don't think anyone wants to be vegan their whole life and never again taste anything from an animal. I understand. Oh, there's people who are like, they're never going to yeah. eat meat again. That's true. Because and, 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 I, and just so you know, background, I was vegan for 10 years yeah. of my life. Mm -hmm. I was vegetarian, vegan from 1989 until about four years ago where I introduced chicken into my life. Now, have I had beef? Yes. I had my first in and out burger that you brought me. Yeah, I wonder who gave that to yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, you brought me an in and out burger. I have never had an in and out burger. And it was a quadruple. Well, I took two patties off. Okay. <laughs> but that was my first time eating that kind of beef in over 30 years. So I'm not afraid of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like it. And and I have enough anecdotal experiences with people, like one of my good friends, Fernando. Uh, who died not long ago hmm. at 114 years old. He didn't eat meat as- Did you just say he was 114? 114. Where is he living? Well, he's dead now. He died. Where was he living? He was in Mesa, California, okay. or Mesa, me, Arizona. And he, I didn't, uh, I thought I didn't hear it correctly. No, he was born in 1901. Whoa. I met him when he was 111 years old. Um, he looked absolutely amazing. And I'm very on honored to have had that opportunity. Um, thanks to Miss Gregory, uh, who's Dick Gregory's niece. And she made that happen. And I got to spend time with him at 111, at 112, at 113. I went to his house. He was in like an assisted living, but he it was self-sustained. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he cooked for himself every day. He exercised. Like little apartments. Yeah, little apartments. And everybody loved him. And I went there and spent the whole day with him from morning to after we ate dinner. I recorded the whole thing, asked all kinds of questions. I mean, this is a guy who retired at 19 in 1956, who watched Dr. King when he was in the 60s speak, who met Jack LaLanne and he was older than Jack. Jack's gone, and I knew Jack mm -hmm. also, and he was still living. And so, did he ever eat a hot dog? Yes. Would he ever eat steak? Absolutely. He had this mindset that if I went to your house and you serve steak, even though that's not my staple, I'm going to eat what you give me. Is that, I mean, that's an old school principle. Hmm. Eat what they put on your plate. And that wasn't his go-to every day, but I know what he ate on a daily basis. Yeah. I know what he put on the skin on a daily basis. I know that he was very active. And I know that he was very stress-free. He was a happy-go-lucky -lucky person. So he touched on all the key areas, right? Mm -hmm. Mindset, uh, what you ate, how you moved, the energy, what you thought about. All of that is contributing toward someone living their healthiest and best life. Can you tell us a little bit more about him, what kind of exercise he did and what you saw um, him eat? Well, he he had some of everything. He had an old little, you know, he gets hot in Arizona. So in Arizona, mm -hmm. he had a, like a this treadmill that he would walk on. And he would kind of walk really fast. Remember, this is he's 113. And he had these dumbbells that he would lift. Um, so he was very active. That was something he did on the regular. He um, he loved oatmeal. I can tell you that much. Ate on the regular. Uh, he drank a lot of hot tea. Uh, loved blueberries. He used extra virgin olive oil. Uh, not only when he cooked, but he rubbed it on his skin. And when you look at photos of him, he did not look 100 and 
13 years old. Not at all. He was mentally clear. I remember one, I was with the famous Dick Gregory, who was a legend for civil rights, first comedian, first black comedian to ever speak in front of a white audience, thanks to Hugh Hefner. Mm. Uh, the guy who really opened up the doors for Richard Pryor and for Bill Cosby. Um, and I got to spend time with Dick Gregory. And he was big into health. And me, Dick Gregory, and Bernando all, we got to sit down for a while. But one time we were standing up for about two hours, me, Dick Gregory, and, Br and Ren Bernando. I, I believe Dick Gregory was like 81 or 83 at the time. And he made a comment. He goes, <laughs> I'm not going to say exactly what Dick Gregory said because he could be a little out there a little bit <laughs> but i remember he made a comment how bernando had been standing up with us talking for two hours mm -hmm. he didn't go to the restroom one time and didn't need to sit and take a break didn't need to sit and i remember him grabbing a glass and he held the glass up and i, I was like well, okay what, should, what are we looking at and the glass of water did not shake and I grabbed that same glass of water and I saw <laughs> <laughs> most of us do shake. I, yeah. saw, I saw a little bit of shaking going on. So, Interesting. so anyway, it's like when you have those experiences and you hear that from people like that and you talk to the Jack Lanes of the world, you know, and Andrew uh, uh, Woods of the world and, like, and Andrew Wilds of the world and the Dean Ornish. I've met all these people, broke bread, spoke with them. I've heard there a lot of them are extreme, mm -hmm. and every time I've been with any of them, they always acknowledge what I do as like that's good stuff. Yeah, because they were all extreme, and I was in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Yeah. That, those are their their words. Mm -hmm. Dick Gregory was not against what I said. I said I will show you how to eat the foods that you love, and you can lose all the weight you want. That was a big part of my promise. So if you're going to eat fast food, I'm going to show you how to do it. If you're going to eat at home and cook and grow your own food in the back, great. I'll show you how to do it. So it was that ability to meet people where they were, were or are. That is one of my personal differentiators from everybody else.